Oh, okay, we're getting live. See people joining. Looking at the counter, <laughs> it seemed the numbers go up. <laughs> okay, now some somebody left already, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we we should start. We should probably start. So hi, um, welcome to uh, our webinar uh, organized and hosted by the ENIST uh, trauma section. And um, uh, on behalf of all speakers, I'm very glad that you joined. We want to talk about cranioplasty, which is somehow en vogue because it has been. Another webinar touching this topic just recently from the ENS. But ours is a bit more, uh, I would say, profound. And we want to talk about uh, standards, current standards, but also trends. And if we, uh, we have four um, esteemed speakers. And um, I'll just uh, introduce them one by one when they give their talks. Uh, please uh, post your questions in the chat, if that's possible. Um, we can collect some some questions there. You can also um, wait for the dis general discussion. We want to do a group discussion at the end um, for the last, let's say, 30 minutes. Um, if you have very urgent questions uh, after each talk, just uh, raise your hand, and then we can also uh, do a, a brief intermediate discussion, depending a little bit on the time as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker, Harry Mee, uh, joining us from uh, Cambridge. And uh, Harry, you um, are uh, from the Division of Rehabilitation Medicine and Neurosurgery, so a little uh, different approach maybe. And uh, you will be giving the first talk about uh, consensus statements uh, and prospective registries from to uh, what is the evidence for cranioplasty. That's so, great. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, great. Can you see that okay? Is that coming through? Fantastic. Well, hello everyone. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk today, uh, Alexandra, and thank you to EANS for hosting the webinar. So my name is Dr. Me. Uh, yes, I come at this from a slightly different perspective. I'm a rehabilitation medicine registrar. I work in the United Kingdom and I have a particular interest with the Cambridge group looking at neurological uh, the impact that craniopathy has on neurological outcome uh, following a traumatic brain injury. And I'm going to talk really to set the scene today for 10 or 15 minutes, just talking around uh, current uh, evidence base for cranioplasty, looking at uh, uh, the, the, the evidence over, over, over the literature over the last sort of five or 10 years, uh, and look to see where uh, possible registries and work is taking us moving forward. So we all know that over the last 10 or 15 years, there have been a number of uh, uh, ra randomised trials uh, looking at the role of decompressive craniectomy for traumatic brain injury, both as a primary and a secondary measure. And this has led to an increased number of decompressive craniectomies. If we look at hospital episode statistical data from the UK uh, pre-pandemic, we can see that on average there's been about a 15% uh, increase in the number of decompressive craniectomies from 2014 to 2019. And this is very much uh, led therefore onto an increase at the same number of, uh, of, of increase uh, in the numbers of cranioplasties. We do about 1400 craniectomies a year, and that translates into uh, about five to 600 cranioplasties a year on, on, an, on, an, on a national basis. But the cranioplasty is not a new entity. It's been around for many, many years. Uh, it was first formally described by a, a Flemish physician back in the early 16th century uh, called Fallopius, where they described that a bone could be replaced if the dura was not compromised, but a gold plate considered if the dura was broken. And since then, there have been uh, various uh, it, it, uh clearly various uh, uh, neurosurgical developments uh, around cranioplasty and to what is now a commonly practiced uh, 
uh, neurosurgical procedure throughout the world. Although as we, we know it as cranial reconstruction, it's not without its difficulties and complications, and it, need, it needs to be uh, carefully planned as, as, as we will uh, uh, discuss over the following hour or so. We know that the cranioplasty is there to aid protection, uh, to help with skull contouring uh, and can mitigate the effects of the sunken flap and treat formally the syndrome of Trafind if it is present. But also there's growing body of evidence suggesting of a impact on neurological outcome following cranioplasty. Uh, the International Classification of Functioning Disability of Health as demo as uh, described on the right side of the screen is a process and a way in which we can uh, put together rehabilitation programs uh, and it's an important health aspect when we look at planning uh, any health intervention, certainly from a rehabilitation perspective. And it's important to note that the cranioplasty, we should be viewing this uh, within someone's rehabilitation program rather than just something that happens many months or many weeks after a particular brain injury. There are many clinical and research considerations uh, around cranioplasty, and these have developed over many, many years. Uh, there was a consensus meeting uh, on post-traumatic cranioplasty uh, in 2018. I'm sure many of us are aware of uh, the, uh, the the uh, the the. The, uh, the, the the manuscript on the front here, but essentially it was separated down into five key areas of interest, both from a clinical and an academic perspective. So the first one was indications and technique, and I'll touch on that. But my neurosurgical colleagues, I'm sure, will will uh, describe that in more detail as 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 in later in the webinar. The second is looking at materials, uh, and then timing hydrocephalus and paediatrics. So I'll spend a couple of minutes just touching on each of these each of these separately. So indications and techniques, uh, the discussion focused on post-traumatic uh, uh, cranioplasty and covered both uh, unilateral and bifrontal cranioplasties. I think the overall consensus was that there should be uh, this, the, the, the cranioplasty regardless of the timing of such should be considered in as many patients as possible if it was if it was plausible to do and it was appropriate to do so this shouldn't be something that should just be decided and potentially done or not done it's something that should definitely be considered in all patients if uh, if, if if in the right clinical setting material wise is a very interesting area uh, there are many many different materials uh, that can be used for cranioplasty as as, as we know uh, globally, the most commonly used is the, auto is the autologous bone, but that isn't without its difficulties, especially around uh, rates of uh, bone absorption. And certainly over the last five or ten years, synthetic materials have certainly taken over. In the United Kingdom, uh, titanium plate and titanium mesh are the two most commonly used uh, material types. Uh, and But there are, there are, there, there are many others. Uh, there's no single consensus as to which is the optimal material and perhaps registries is one way that we would or should be uh, moving towards to be able to get better longitudinal data to look at longer term outcomes of different material types. Hydrocephalus was the third key area that was uh, that was discussed within the consensus meeting. I'm not going to read all of the nine points here, but these were the results from the from the voting uh, uh, that, that was done within the conference. And I, I think the main area around this was there, there wasn't uh, there was agreement that there was a, a huge amount of uncertainty around the optimal way to uh, manage uh, patients uh, with post-traumatic uh, hydrocephalus related to the brain injury and also related to the cranioplasty and further work and further research is needed to get definitive outcomes. From the paediatric perspective, really, they have looked at three main topics within uh, within the paediatric population. Uh, I'm only touching on this really today because there the, the, the could from the from I wasn't I wasn't part of the consensus meeting myself, but there really could have been a, a further uh, uh, consensus meeting purely on paediatric cranioplasty, uh, but the, the the materials timing and defining specific parameters around 
paediatric care is is key in this is in this in this context. Uh, and again, there was general agreement around these three areas. Timing is very interesting, and I know we've got a talk. Uh, one of the the the, uh, the the talks later on is is looking specifically uh, at at timing. But just to, to to do a few general points on it, I think there's continued debate around what is the optimal time to perform a cranioplasty, uh, and we don't yet know that. Uh, classically, the delineation of time has come at pre and post twelve weeks. Uh, that's within so within three months or, or greater than three months but i think it's as as was discussed within the consensus meeting this has to be based on a per patient perspective and there has to be an optimal time for a, for, for the individual patient to have the cranioplasty and it felt that the delineation of time was perhaps slightly slightly academic uh having said that uh there were other uh time delineations that were uh, agreed on and and that's looking at ultra early so within six weeks uh between three six weeks and six weeks between six uh th six weeks and three months three months to six months and then greater than six months but i think the actual uh definitive time point around uh when is the optimal time to form the cranioplasty is still not uh not not known let me why is that important? Well, traditionally, it was thought that uh, your increased rate of complications occurred if you had an earlier cranioplasty. And therefore, cranioplasties were often uh, done six months, nine months or, or longer following following a decompression. And that was really to try and reduce the risk of complications. The overall risk of complications, regardless of uh, timing of cranioplasty, is around 20% in the literature. Now that does vary hugely and it depends on definitions around complication rates. So for example, uh, infections, uh, in some places it's uh, the infection rates of 30 or 40 percent because superficial infections are included skin infections for example in other places it's much lower because an infection is only counted if a, a, a cranioplasty or brain the, the the plate actually has to be removed from uh from the from uh from from, from a patient following an infection uh, another one is hydrocephalus so the rates of hydrocephalus vary hugely uh, this again is dependent on whether you include radiological uh enlargement of ventricles or uh uh, the need for ventricular peritoneal shunting. So there are variations in complication rates, but if you looking at systematic reviews, and this is one of them here, the overall complication rate is about 20, is about 20%. Interestingly, that was independent of uh, timing of cranioplasty. So here they looked at uh, those that happened within three and greater than three months, uh, and there was no change in overall complication rates in the two groups. So since, since this has uh, been looked at carefully in a number of other systematic reviews as well, uh, the, 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 the cause for a delayed cranioplasty due to increased risk of complications has actually uh, been, been, uh, been, been looked at for, for formally now. There are other complications associated as well. The sunken flap syndrome or syndrome of Trefind is one of them. And this is one of the reasons for an expediated cranioplasty. Uh, and also uh, other such uh, reasons such as seizures, as I say, hydrocephalus infection are, are key areas to, to consider. But also from a timing perspective, there's this concept of neurological recovery. So what we mean by that is, is how someone has improved following their cranioplasty. Uh, the pathophysiological consequences of, of the cranioplasty is thought to be one of the key considerations about why some patients seem to improve more than others. Again, there's ongoing research in this area uh, on, on, in, in, many different, uh, in many different countries, and we don't yet have the definitive answer, but it's thought to be due to changes in cerebral, uh, spinal, um, CSF hydrodynamics, contralateral and ipsilateral improvement in cerebral blood flow as well and cerebral oxygenation but again there's no definitive output here about why some pe people seem to improve and some people just don't improve at all and I'm sure we can all think of cases where we, we, we see both of these. 
Uh, uh, this is just some other uh, uh, this, uh, examples of relatively recent uh, papers and manuscripts looking at uh, the association of earlier craniopathy with, with neurological improvement. When we try and uh, look at neurological outcome, we also be very clear about what we mean by that. And there's a huge variety in the way that neurological outcome is, me is, is measured. That's not just associated with cranioplasty, that's in, in, any, in, in any neurological output really, but obviously here focusing on cranioplasty. There are many different ways of measuring neurological outcome from a, a global functional outcome. And obviously the GOSC, the Glasgow Outcome Score Extended, is one that we commonly, commonly use within the TBI literature. But there's also functional independence. There's ph physiological outcomes, cognitive outcomes uh, and, and, and more basic parameters such as your global, uh, your Glasgow Coma Scale as well. And I think until we have a better way of standardising what we need to uh, measure, it's very difficult to look at those meta-analyses and compare studies. This was one study showing uh, the lo looking at uh, changes in, in neurological state post cranioplasty, but the, the variation in, in the outcome measures made it very difficult to make comparisons. Having said that, on a very simple level, there, there, there was some evidence of both motor and cognitive improvements in the earlier group or more motor and cognitive improvements in the earlier group compared to the later group. This was another uh, systematic review by De Kola et al looking at uh, neurological outcome again for cranioplasty and in here again there were great variation in outcome measures used but it did show that there was improved motor function specifically if a cranioplasty was performed within 90 days and not necessarily any cognitive or uh, psychosocial improvement. So what, in what way can we uh, take this forward to perhaps find better ways of collating information together in order to, uh, in order to uh, understand this uh, and, uh, and, and, and look at the literature more broadly? One of this, the ways we do this is looking at prospective registries. Uh, there, are, there are a number of cranioplasty registries across uh, the, the, the European communities. The German Cranial Reconstruction Registry uh, was, was launched back in 2013 at a similar time to the UK one. The German registry has closed formally now, but re reported uh, uh, on uh, such a few years ago. And I'll, I'll touch on that, that in a moment. Registries are there to be able to monitor uh, basic demographic details. Hopefully it will enable uh, practice pattern comparisons between uh, different uh, services within the registry itself and looking at longer term impact of cranioplasty. Again, it can help with understanding neurological impact, functional outcome, quality of life and complications by providing aggregate data uh, over, over, uh, over a number of different a number of different parameters. This is uh, quite a complex slide, so I'm not going to spend too long on it, but it was really just comparing the four, uh, uh, broadly, the four uh, registry or four of the prospective registries within within the, within Europe uh, or the European Union. Uh, the, U the, 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 the registry within the UK, the Italian, the French and the German registry. Some of these are actively... Uh, uh, collating data currently, others have finished collating and others are in the process of starting. And it's just to demonstrate that although there are some differences within each registry, broadly speaking, uh, we're looking at baseline basic craniectomy details, functional status, the procedure details themselves, the implant and the remo any removal or complications associated with that. The follow up and long term outcomes, which is really important from understanding material types and, and other issues, as we've discussed, can be very difficult. And there are many challenges around follow up of, of in, in any long term study uh, and, and, and especially around uh, long term uh, uh, cranioplasty follow up as well. And I know there have been challenges across uh, the, re the, the, the registries that, that, that are in place currently, certainly within the UK. It's very difficult to get sustainable funding for long for long term follow up. That's something that we're trying to explore at, 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 at the moment. 
But as I said, uh, uh, the both the, the UK and the the, the German registry uh, have published data uh, pre pre pandemic, uh, and uh, uh, both looked at uh, a broad data set of 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 what was uh, of of of, uh, of 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 all. Uh, craniopasties within, within a, a set period of time. I won't go into the, the, the outcomes from those today. Just broadly, and I know I'm running over a little bit, but uh, just to give a little bit of a, a update about where we are with the UK CRR at the moment. So we've got eight, nearly 850 entries now into the registry from just under 700 patients across 25 neurosurgical sites within the UK. Uh, about a, a two, uh, a, a, two thirds to one third uh, demographic split between males and females with an average age of 45. Uh, out of those insertions, 80% uh, of them are new insertions and indication for craniectomy is as on the left there. We have about a 10%, 10 to 15% uh, removal, uh, well, sorry, 10% removal rate, slightly higher complication rate within the first 30 days. And the majority or half of those reasons for removal are because of infection. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, overwhelmingly so we use synthetic materials now, and overwhelmingly so the most common uh, material we use is titanium in 80% in of those cases. And we use uh, uh, just less, less than 10% or, 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 or or autologous bone, and actually, it's probably probably less than that year, year, year on year now. But the cranioplasty, although the complications are a, a key consideration in the neurosurgical practice, as I'm sure we'll talk about in the webinar later on, we need to be better at looking at the longer term outcomes, the cosmetic effect, uh, the psychological impact of cranioplasty is so important. The use of helmets, both pre cranioplasty. Uh, and the effect that they have on the, the, the psychological impact of rehabilitation programs are, are, are an area that is, is, is particular of interest of mine. Cranioplasty and the effect of return to driving on, on, on seizure rates, vocational rehabilitation and the effect of flying, although seem relatively uh, 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 issues that might that might be uh, that, that might only come up a bit further down the line where if someone has following their craniopathy is still really important considerations and I'm sure we've all touched on all of these areas when we see patients in 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 clinic following craniopathy. So in conclusion. It's uh, not a simple procedure. We need to make sure we have good multidisciplinary approach right from the offset. And really that starts from the point of the, 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 the decompression. We need to plan ahead to make sure that the cranioplasty can fit into a rehabilitation program. Uh, we need to be aware of the rates of complications, but not necessarily mean that's a reason not to do the cranioplasty and uh, integrate it into the rehabilitation pathway where appropriate and then we all need to look at improving our long-term surveillance of, of these plates. So I hope that's given a bit of an overview about uh, cranioplasty, some of the current literature uh, and some of the work going forward. And I'll uh, pass back to uh, uh, Alex, Alexander. Thank you so very much. Harry, thank you for giving this excellent introduction and uh, also sharing uh, a lot of your work and data and congrats to all that you have been doing with the registry, especially in, uh, on outcomes. Um, I see that in the chat there's um, already some discussion and um, there's also a, a question asked that needs to be answered. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not we should go into the discussion now. I think if we do so, um, we, we just take too long. So I would propose that we continue and then we can actually go through either the chat or you people can, can raise their hand again and sure. we can answer those questions. Okay. All right. So, yeah. so if, if that's okay, Harry and uh, the others as well. Yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So um, next talk will be um, a then more uh, neurosurgical um, topic. Uh, Dirk Lindner from um, University of Leipzig in Germany will give his presentation on actually doing a cranioplasty and especially handling uh, complications. Uh, thank you, Dirk, for joining us and for giving this talk. Yeah, hello, I hope everybody can hear me, okay? 
Good. I will start. I'm from Leipzig um, in the eastern part of Germany, and we have a special um, interest in specification for cranioplasty and decompression, and that's why I'm also interested in this part. And as Harry has uh, told us, there is a sorry. There's a this is a simple surgical technique, and I have to talk about this some practical parts about the interoperative situation and complication. And I mean, we have complication up to 50%, maybe 45%. It's so it's so high, but it's a simple technique. There is a discrepancy between these both facts. And we have also a rev revision rate, which is dramatic for the patient uh, from five to 30% with the loss of the cranioplasty at the end, maybe. So, and we have a problem. We, there is a low number, maybe on one hand, for really, really prospective or randomized data. It's 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 really seldom. So, at the end, there is a there's there's a big problem, but maybe it's it's not known or it's not really uh, um, the weight is not so high for this problem. So I focus mainly on these four. Uh, uh, literature or papers harry has talked mainly about that i my based um, lecture is on the on the multi center study from germany and also from the prospective registry from crane of craneoplasty in united kingdom and ireland and also i uh, thought a little bit about this consensus statement in the novel uh, two years ago it, which was very interesting because there are people from all over the world and they have totally different ideas about cranioplasty than we think in Europe is, is normal or unnormal and so on. So what are the main focus? If we, if we look practical, before we start with the cranioplasty, we have to look to the risk factors of the patients. And the, the first risk is simply the number of operations were done before. and. Um, each of oper the operation number is, is a really important value. Also the patient age, it's clear if you talk, if you compare patient with 20 years or 80 years, it's totally different. We will hear something about timing of, of shunt and cranioplasty. Is it different? Is it, is it the same time when what is better and so on? And we have also to look about, uh, to think about the high, hypertension and other comorbidities like diabetes and so on. And and this is very, very important. We have to look to the neurological and clinical status. This means maybe this is normal, but you, I think sometimes these patients came, in, came from the, the rehabilitation center and then they are on, on the unit and we have to make the cranioplasty operation. But if you see these patients in the daily routine, they often are without any movement of the legs, the MRS is maybe five. So I think from my personal point, that's patient with a dyspalic situation, we have to think about, is it really necessary to perform a cranioplasty or is it maybe better to uh, uh, create a helmet and uh, look for better rehabilitation and so on. This is a big fact in the daily routine. So again, for the young uh, surgeon, it is necessary. You have to go to these people and you have to look to the head like this monkey with the other. What is the situation of the wound? Yeah. Is there a big scar? Is, the, is there a thin skin? What happened with the vascularization in this field? Some of these patients have local infection on the other uh, part of the, of the body. So so you can really easily avoid some problems during and after the operation. And for me, it is really important that you also um, create or you need a new CT scan before you operate. In Leipzig, we, we are focused on 14, maybe 21 days, so two or three weeks, not longer, of course. This is the state of the art. This is the situation you compare later after the operation. And again, we... We talk about an operation with a high number of complications. And I think, therefore, it is really important to start with an optimal situation. And it's also interesting to think a little bit more about the head shape. So I will pres present it. 
in our German study, re register study, we presented some um, facts in 2018, and we measured also the number of intraoperative complication. And this was, was in comparison to the postoperative complication after 30 days uh, past operation, only 2.4 to 2.7% uh, with no difference between autologous and uh, computer aided uh, manufactured uh, carinoplasty. Interestingly, the highest number was a problem with CSF leak, followed by hemorrhagic complication interoperative and bound closure difficulties. Brain swelling and implant fainting also happened, but in a low, really low number of patients. So if we look to the shape of the head, we, we um, have three different types, and this is really, really important. Type number two is the, the intermediate type. We know this is perfect for us for operation because the brain is in the same level as the, the surrounding bone, and this is easy to perform. But usually this patient are not so often. We are, often we see type number one with a big hole with a with a, with a um, difference between the bone and the brain and the dura. And this type is much more difficult. And also type three with swelling and the a level over the bone is of, often happen. This is type one, a typical problem, an old man with a thin skin. And you can see it easily in this uh, part. There's a, there's between the bone and the skin, there are only one or two millimeter. And this is a typical problem for, for later wound problem. And so you have to look to the head again. You have to go to the patient and you have to check how is the movement of, of the skin? Is it possible to, uh, to uh, move the, the skin from other areas to this area for a better uh, uh, wound closure? And this is really important. Other problem is you have to check the vascularization. Sometimes in Leipzig, we use also endothelin green, green to, to check is there a good vascularization or not. And sometimes we also use the, an expander for a better skin. This is relative seldom, but I will show you some pictures. Also, it is interesting in, in this type, we often find calcified dura maybe also based on aseptic osteonecrosis. If you have a calcified dura and you have this people with the hole, again, you have, you have to remove this calcification because if you don't remove this calcification, then the dura is not, mo not movable and you have a big room between the dura and the cranioplasty. And this is also often a, region, a, a reason for problems post-operative. Sometimes you have also to discuss what happened with the scar. In an optimal point from a neurosurgeon, it would be optimal to remove the scar, but then you haven't enough uh, uh, skin to uh, uh, close the wound. So, and also in these people, it is very important to uh, use the technique of tending sutures to make the dura movable to the craniplasty. Another question is also the problem of drain, active drain or antibiotics post-operative. Again, coming to our uh, German registry, we had also uh, measured the problem or there are some in, uh, with the tending sutures and there was nearly 26, 25% who have who never used this kind of tending sutures and uh, the other clinics use the tending sutures and we could find the same number of complications at the end. There was a clear uh, statistical uh, point that the use of tending sutures is helpful in these cases. This is a typical intraoperative uh, situation with a cranial mosaic. And so intraoperatively, you have to look for the perfect border between the implant and the surrounding bone, then the fitting is also optimal. The next problem 
is the tending suture again. There is no clear answer how many of these tending suture is needed. You have to check two, three, four, some people need more, but I think in this kind of type one, again, head shape, it is really helpful. And again, it is helpful to look for the muscle reconstruction, the temporal muscle reconstruction, and also to use this periosteum together with the muscle to protect the room between the skin and the cranioplasty. This is also important for the vascularization in this area. So you have really look for, for optimal uh, operation. This is an example for an ex uh, expander for this patient, he had three or four operations with a cranioplasty and we had to remove because of wound closure problems. And at the end, we used, uh, we used an expander to uh, create more skin for optimal closure. In the other patient, we had this problem with an uh, optimal uh, closure of the wound in a white light, but with ECG, we could easily see there was a there were avascular structure in the neighbor of the wound closure and we could remove this part. And at the end, the patient ha had the perfect um, cosmetic result in this area. A second example is this old man. He had uh, firstly a, a bone a cranioplasty, but then the aseptic osteonecrosis happened and we, uh, he came in an urgent situation to us and we uh, created this uh, nice titan titanium mesh to um, avoid a, a bigger problem. And at the end of the operation, we are totally satisfied with the shape and so on. And the CT scan was perfect. But three months later, the patient come to us and you could see the pattern of the, of the crab. So it was... We are not satisfied longer with, with the result, but the patient uh, don't want any other operation. And at the end, he, he was satisfied and that's okay. But again, if you have this thin skin, it is not optimal to use a crab or other cranioplasty with this, yeah, with this problem. A third example is this uh, young man with a, a car accident and we had to remove the, the bone in different pies and also parts of the roof of the orbiter. And so the cosmetic res result was terrible. And for this kind of, of protection and also for this 3D reconstruction, it is necessary to use a material which is optimal in 3D uh, shaping but also to, uh, that you can work with the material interoperatively. We used a, a, a special plastic called PEC, not PEAK, PEC, because of the raw uh, surface. And at the end, the cosmetic result was very good, but that's another point of this problem. So let's us come to the different types of head shape, the type two, again, this is the intermediate, uh, the best performer. And we should not have a big problem with this uh, with these people. I think it's not really necessary to use tending suture and for the train sometimes you need it, but it's not absolutely needed. This third type, type three, it's more problematic because he had the swelling, he had a different shape. It's, it's thicker than the brain and the and the, and the uh, ventricular structure than the, the normal bone, and you. Uh, must perform a ventricular function or anything else to reduce this mass. So the question is, what is better to drain the ventricle or to use a lumbar drain? And what happened with the temporal muscle? And should we ex what, what should we do with the excess of the skin? That's interesting questions. So there are only one uh, publication from Heidelberg in 2018 about 14 people so it's a low number of patients with the idea they tested the lumbar drain and they are really satisfied without complication in this patient so maybe the lumbar drain is better than the ventricle puncture. this is the that's the question 
if we ask in the German um, uh, DGNC, the German uh, Neurosurgery so so Society, one third use the lumbar drain and two third the ventricular punction. So it's nearly this, it's not usual or it's not so often that the lumbar drain is used. So what is optimal? In our study, it, it was a little bit different. In uh, a quarter of the patient, the ventricular function or the, 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 the CSF uh, uh, reduction, was, reduction was necessary. And in, in this remaining 85 patient, we had the same complication rate with ventricular function, function in, in comprising the lumbar drain. So, but the, the number of lumbar drain was lower at the end it is an advantage in this uh, registration for, for ventricular puncture. So at the end, I can't say this is better than this. So it isn't easy and it depends on the patient. Also, the question was uh, discussed what happened with the, with the train, with the wound train. And uh, we had the same complication rate in patient with and without train. So what are the red flags at the end for this for the intraoperative operative um, um, work. I think you should look for optimal position of the head intraoperatively. You have to look for, for a ventricular puncture or lumbar drain for the type three with the mass excess. And for patient with um, the skin problem, you have to look for the vascularization. During the operation, it is clear we have the perioperative antibiotics and you have to look for a clear border between Dua and Boone in the whole area for a perfect fitting material. You have to avoid the Dura opening and the periosteum fixation is also very important. And the drain, I think, should be active. CT scan after the operation is also good within 24 hours. Thank you for your interest. And that's a picture of the traffic from the day from Leipzig. Dirk, yeah, snowy times right now. <laughs> um, thank you very much for uh, your excellent presentation as well and for highlighting and sharing complications and images. It's always really perfect. Thank um, you. Is, is previously, I think, decided uh, the discussion is really active there in the in the webinar chat. In uh, us, the um, the the panel basically, we can also um, just chat and talk to people uh, during the talks, which I think is 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 fine. But um, for the sake of time, we just continue with the next uh, talk. So um, the third talk for today, and now um, it's all about timing and uh, Rick uh, Reberg from uh, Leiden University Medical Center will uh, give his presentation on uh, yeah, ultra early, too late, or too late cranioplasty. Um, yeah, thank you, Alexander. Um, trying to share my screen, and I'm able to, because I think Derek is still sharing. Yeah, true. I think if you can, uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, again, thank you, uh, Alexander, for the introduction and the kind words. Um, and thank you for ENS for hosting this uh, webinar. I'm uh, I'm Rick Freiberg from uh, Leiden University, and uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the timing of craniopathy. So Harry uh, already touched a bit on the on the timing of craniopathy. So I'm trying to to add some relevant details. Uh, and uh, touch on the recent Santa TBI study we, uh, we performed with an international group of uh, authors, including Harry and Alexander. Um, so I think the, the background is a little bit uh, unnecessary, perhaps, with all these uh, neurosurgical experts. So the most important part is that, that in, regarding timing, there's still a lot of clinical equipoise um, on whether it should be performed early or late or in recent surges, uh, even ultra early within six weeks. Um, and I'm going to give a short overview of the, uh, oh, it's not correctly sharing it. Yeah. So I'm going to give a quick overview of the, um, the current evidence and then uh, touch on the center TBI study we did. So as you can see here, there was a recent um, 
uh, review performed by uh, Dr. Colias and Dr. Iacorino from uh, Italy and uh, Cambridge. And they gave a nice overview of the high variance in definition of what is considered an early cranial plasty or a late cranial plasty. As you can see on the far side of the right here, that, that there is a, it varies between three months or one month or 10 weeks or even 16 weeks. Um, but the most used uh, cutoff for early cranial plasty is 90 days. And as Harry uh, briefly explained, this, that was also um voted on in the uh, recent consensus meeting that three days is the three months is the cutoff for the early cranial plasty as well as the ultra early cranial plasty you can see in the medical literature that that's around 30 to 42 days as a cutoff so if a cranial plasty was performed within six weeks 42 days then it's considered ultra early um yeah, so the, as mentioned before, the, the evidence is very limited. There is a high variability in, in outcome measures, uh, definitions for complications, for example. Um, so I've tried to, to narrow it down and provide two most pragmatic main outcomes, which are the uh, general and most frequent complication rates after cranial plasty and the functional or neurological outcome in these uh, severe TBI patients. Um, and based on the, the the conclusions, they are also very variable with certain complications being um, highly associated with early cranial plasty or even uh, not even uh, or inversely associated with early cranial plasty and other research. Um, and there were two main large systematic reviews and meta-analysis uh, from the COLA et al. and Malcolm et al. from uh, 2016 to 2018. And I found a couple of the large retrospective uh, studies, which have added as uh, additional uh, evidence. So we'll start with the complications as uh, surgical site infections. And Malcolm et al. from the systematic review included a total of uh, over 2000 patients from 18 different studies. And as can be seen in the top right, uh, they found no pooled association uh, between surgical site infections or bone flap infections or even uh, fever. Um, after a cranial plasty, favoring either early or late. And that same, uh, uh, no association can be found in a study, recent study by Ethan et al. in a single center retrospective uh, analysis of 435 patients. They also found uh, no association between the infection rate and uh, cranial plasty timing. And a, a larger single center retrospective analysis by Morton et al. from 2017, they uh, analyzed 754 patients. You can see the uh, complication rate uh, graph there in the right bottom of the screen. And they found uh, an overall around six to 7% in infection rate. Um, and made the most of the infections were from the patients which were operated uh, ultra early, age, or even you could say extremely early within 14 days after decompressive craniectomy. Even uh, a 30% 30, 30 um, uh, infection rate within these patients. Uh, and the infection rate dropped uh, around uh, after around uh, 42 days. So bone resorption uh, also an important uh, uh, outcome of uh, or complication of uh, cranial plasty. You know, looking at the same uh, systematic review, Malcolm and I also found no pool association or uh, between early cranial plasty or, or late cranial plasty and the uh, bone resorption rate. So uh, it must be noted that. They define bone resorption uh, either clinically or uh, radiolog radiologically. A large uh, retrospective analysis by Rashidi et al., more recent, of 303 patients. They found around 10 patients with bone resorption, which was uh, based on the clinical findings. And they also found no uh, clear association. And again, uh, the study by Morton et al., they uh, um, found they did not provide any odds ratios or hazard ratios. But out of the 500 total uh, autologous cranial plasty procedures, there was around a 6% bone resorption rate. And it, uh, uh, it showed a higher frequency in the cranial plasties performed after 90 days, around 3 versus 10%. Looking at hydrocephalus, it's, it's, uh, there's an, another trend can be seen. So in the same systematic review by Malcolm et al., we, they found a positive pooled association with early cranial plasty. Uh, and a hydrocephalus, so around an odds ratio of 2.4. Um, but these findings were mainly based on uh, 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 a 
general pooled association. So there were no clear individual studies covering an, an, an a grant association, a positive association. So it was based on the pooled analysis. And Merton et al. from 2017 uh, defined hydrocephalus as, as an hydrocephalus which required shunting. And they found an uh, around 9% hydrocephalus rate, uh, which was correlated with time to craniplasty uh, from decompressive craniectomy. So an odds ratio of 0 0.9 uh, per 10 day increase, which means that the, the more time elapses between uh, decompressive craniectomy and craniplasty, the lower the odds of contracting a, an hydrocephalus were. And the same uh, study, uh, as mentioned earlier by Eden et al, found uh, around a 3% uh, occurrence rate uh, prevalence, and uh, they found no association between uh, hydrocephalus and uh, crane perceived timing. Um, so next are the seizures. Uh, Malcolm et al found no pools, pooled association, which can be seen again in the table uh, to the right, or the figure to the right. And again, uh, Morton uh, also did not find um, any uh, um, significant difference in the seizure rates, although the the few fee seizures they that, that that occurred were all in the the late cranial procedure group, so all uh, our cranial procedure performed after ninety days, and Ethan et al again they had around a five percent uh, seizure rate, which matches that of Morton, and they found no clear association as well. And looking at perhaps a more important uh, measure, which was a uh, functional or neurological outcome. And I'd like to uh, begin by looking at these uh, two systematic reviews and meta-analysis by Malcolm et al. and Decola et al. And as can be seen on the first graph from Malcolm et al., there was a high variety in uh, neurological outcome measures. For example, the Bartol index or the Konofsky score or the, the regular, can I say, the Glasgow Coma scale. And based on these findings, they concluded that early craniplasty is associated with greater neurological improvement. <laughs> but as you take a closer look, it's mostly based on a study by uh, Bender et al. from 2013 and a study by Kong et al. Um, from 2014, which were uh, single center studies and uh, with relatively small sample sizes. For example, the Kong et al. study had 55 patients with a very high uh, uh, odds ratio of uh, uh, functional outcome and early cranial C. And looking at the, the next one from the COLA et al. from 2018 as well, again, we can see a high variety of this was uh, neurocognitive outcomes. It, uh, for example, the MMZ being used and a very limited number of patients which were included uh, for the analysis. And there was no clear association uh, found between any of the uh, studies included favoring either early or late craniopathy, uh, except for the, the uh, possible improvement of motor scores when craniopathy was performed within 90 days. So they included three, three studies and they found a pooled uh, positive association of early craniopathy and uh, improved motor outcomes. Um, and adding on to that for the ultra early craniopathy, because there has been a recent search in uh, 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 literature, but also in uh, questions about if brain procedure performed ultra early or within 15 to 30 days, that it might uh, uh, limit the risk of hydrocephalus or even uh, infection rates. So Ethan et al. looked at this and they found no clear association as well. And uh, a re more recent uh, review from SETI et al., another single uh, center uh, retrospective analysis of 77 patients considered ultra early within 30 days, and they found a possible positive association of post uh, cranial plasty hydrocephalus and uh, ultra early cranial plasty compared to cranial plasty performed after that, um, which you can see to the right in the red bottom. Uh, and uh, again, Morton et al, as discussed earlier, they found the evident increase in infection and hydrocephalus occurrence when cranial plasty was performed within 42 days, which is, uh, can be seen in the graph uh, which we showed earlier. So in conclusions, there are large disparities in uh, timing definitions, what is early, what is late, in uh, complication rates, but also in complication definitions. So what, what is considered a bone resorption, what is considered uh, an infection. Um, some studies by uh, included by Malcolm and all even uh, included uh, infection rates as uh, defined them as uh, having a fever or antibiotic use. Um, and there's a high variety in the outcome measures for functional and neurological outcome. 
And most evidence or most conclusions drawn are based on uh, rather low quality evidence from small sample size, single center retrospective studies, which was um, one of the reasons why the recent consensus meeting, uh, as mentioned by Harry before, uh, called for data from uh, large multi-center prospective cohort studies, such as center TBI and provi providing bespoke recommendations for these, uh, these patients. So that's, that is one of the reasons why we performed, uh, together with an international group of authors, we performed in the in, uh, prospective multicenter observation study within Center TBI in the NetCure database. Uh, uh, looking at the early versus delayed screening plus the after decompressive screening to me in a traumatic brain injury. And we uh, analyzed data from a little over 5,000 unique patients from Center TBI and NetCure. And we based the early versus delayed cutoff again on the available literature and the recent consensus meeting. Um, and out of those little over 5,000 unique patients, uh, 227 received cranial plus T, uh, of which we included 173 patients. Um, and we examined mainly as primary outcome the GO scores at 12 months, but also the quality of life ex as expressed using colibri or complications. Uh, uh, and to provide more bespoke recommendations, we uh, employed uh, additional subgroup analysis and to strengthen the primary outcome analysis, we have conducted similar uh, sensitivity analysis using propensity score match. Unfortunately, we were not able to look at the uh, autologous or versus synthetic data, since that was not collected in the either center TBI or NetCure databases, unfortunately. So looking at uh, the two groups you included, 73 patients were included in the early group and 100 uh, patients were uh, uh, in the delayed group. And they were similar in important baseline characteristics such as age or baseline uh, GCS scores. If they have uh, underwent a major extracranial intervention or CT imaging and uh, possibly more importantly, the impact probability for a favorable outcome or mortality. Um, notably are the differences in hospital and length of stay because uh, the median score uh, in days was higher in the early training C group. And, uh, why that was, um, we'll get to that later. You can see to the right the distribu distribution of uh, the cranial plus timing uh, with a median timing of uh, 101 days after decompressive cranial to me. Looking at the primary outcome, the GO score at 12 months, you can uh, see the distribution here. And we can see that it doesn't show a clear, consistent shift, preferring either early or late cranial plus T, which was uh, confirmed by the um, ordinal logistic regression model we, uh, we performed, uh, um, showing no significant odds ratio, as well as for seizures and colibri scores. We did find a notable difference in uh, hydrocephalus occurrence, 12% in the early cranial plus T group and 4% uh, in the delayed group which yielded uh, an odds ratio of four, um, uh, which, which indicated that uh, uh, there was an odds ratio of, of hydrocephalus occurring in early cranial plus of four. And as well, uh, if we're looking at timing as a continuous matter, yeah, rather than using the arbitrary chosen um, cutoffs, recently uh, we um, found similar differences and uh, no significant difference in GOES or seizure occurrence. But we did, did find a difference in uh, the same uh, hydrocephalus uh, association. It's a bit harder to understand, but we can see that, as, as was done with the study by Morton et al., that the odds ratio is lower. So the, uh, the odds of hydrocephalus decreases when more time elapses um, uh, between decompressive craniotomy and cranioplasty. Uh, looking at the subgroup analysis, we can see in this forest plot there was no, we looked at age or TBI severity, DC location, if it's by frontal hem and hemocranectomy, or if a uh, decompressive cranial was uh, primary or secondary, we found no uh, uh, positive association between early or the late pregnancy and uh, uh, GOES. We did find a, a notable difference in uh, if a major extracranial intervention was performed at baseline, so, so during initial admission. And we found uh, that um, if, if a major extracranial intervention was performed, that the, the early cranial placebo patients had a higher odds of, uh, of go uh, and higher goes, so higher functional outcome. And uh, as a supplementary analysis, we, we looked at the ultra cranial, ultra early cranial placebo within uh, six weeks, but we did not find any uh, association between uh, goes and uh, ultra early cranial placebo. 
we did find very high uh, intercenter and intercountry variability uh, across Europe. There were over uh, 65 centers participating in center TBI and uh, Netcure. And we did see in the median odds ratio of 2.3 uh, for the center between the centers and in the countries of 2.1, which indicate a very high uh, a difference in likelihood of undergoing uh, uh, early cranial plus T, which also may indicate a possible uh, difference in treatment preference uh, around uh, Europe. So in discussion, so we, we found similar functional outcomes, quality of life and seizure occurrence between early or delayed craniopathy, we did find a positive association between early craniopathy and hydrocephalus. And we did find in our subgroup analysis a positive association between early craniopathy uh, in polytrauma patients. Um, so what are the, the plus points of our study? So it was prospective. It was based on prospective data. It's a multi-center study. It's the largest uh, population till day, uh, at this point. Due to the, the multivariable, uh, multivariate uh, adjustment in our logistic regression model and the additional sensitivity analysis and the similar uh, baseline characteristic between the early and the late groups. And, uh, we minimized the chance of residual confounding. Uh, and it was the first study that analyzed, were the first study to analyze quality of life in regards to green plus T timing. So one of our, uh, one of the limitations is that with these uh, heterogeneous study populations and in these highly uh, how, how do you, uh, confounding um, subjects, the residual confounding may still persist, especially confounding by indication. Unfortunately, we were not able to analyze data on infection rates or bone resorption, which as mentioned earlier, are a rather important complication after uh, cranioplasty. Uh, another limitation is that uh, the, the exact date or the precise date of hydrocephalus and seizures diagnosis are missing. So they were noted on the three months follow-up form or the six months or the 12 months, um, but the exact date was missing. So either when a cranial PC was performed at 30 days, for example, the hydrocephalus may be diagnosed before those 30 days or after those 30 days, which was uh, uh, unfortunate. And uh, GOES remains a rather crude outcome measure for uh, measuring uh, neurocognitive status. As mentioned before, there are uh, high variability and outcome measure. We try to, uh, uh, as a pragmatic approach, we use the GOES for de determining uh, functional outcome, but it, it's not an accurate tool to determine neuro neurocognitive status. So in conclusion, the study suggests that uh, there's comparable functional and outcome and quality of life between early and the late craniopathy patients. Um, and therefore, there may be no reason for neurosurgeons to delay craniopathy after the first admission, but they should remain vigilant on the increased possibility of hydrocephalus. Uh, and that was it. So I'd like to give the word, uh, word back to uh, Alexander. Thank you, Rick, also for sharing your data and, and giving these, uh, these hints towards uh, time point and maybe earlier time points. Um, now we have um, touched this very important topic, uh, timing and the last talk, the last topic will be very, uh, yeah, similarly important materials. And uh, Johannes uh, from Salzburg, uh, we talk about um, general anaplastic implant designs, uh, materials, but also his own experience with uh, 3D printing and Looking very much forward to actually seeing and hearing what you guys have been cooking in Salzburg. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the for the invitation. I'm happy to speak about our our concepts uh, with uh, 3D printing for uh, cranioplasty. So um, um, I think my talk is the trends part of this of this uh, lecture. And I will start in the in the past. Um, no, I cannot. Okay, no disclosures, which is which is kind of important because I will talk about industrial stuff. Um, um when I came to Salzburg in uh, twenty eighteen, we we used a concept that was probably developed in the fifties. Um, and when you got to the OR to do a cranioplastic surgery, you would get this tray of of lead plates and a, a small hammer and scissors, and then you could cut the lead plate into shape um, and fill some um, PMMA inside. 
and um, adapt it to the to the shape of the of the prepared head. And uh, after after heating started, you would redraw the the whole thing, uh, take out the implant, cut the edges, and then and then insert the implant. And this works astonishingly fairly well. Uh, but sometimes uh, I've brought a, an example here. It looks like this. These are a pre-craniectomy, post-craniectomy, and post-cranioplasty CT scans. And um, uh, this was, of course, not uh, not very good for us, not good for the patient. And um, uh, we were lucky to have um, a very innovative uh, department of oral and maxillofacial surgery uh, right next door. So uh, together with them, we developed a concept that we called uh, a spring form uh, technique. Um, uh, some of you might know this kind of spring form. And it's it's quite similar to what we did. This is a cranioplastic spring form, and I will I will uh, um, give you an insight into this uh, concept. Um, uh, so so to start with the with the design process, we did a segmentation at that time with BrainLab uh, software, uh, merging the pre and post craniectomy um, CT scans and. Uh, taking a uh, three-dimensional SDL file into a planning program, um, a design program we used materialized mimics imprint at first. And then you, you have those two models and you put a, uh, a hollow around the pre-craniectomy uh, CT model to take the shape of the head before uh, the craniectomy was performed. And then you would cut uh, around the craniectomy def defect uh, uh, digitally. Um, and uh, then you would get two uh, templates uh, uh, hollow for uh, the for the for the mold and a ring to for the craniectomy defect. Those are then printed on a on a, a desktop uh, 3D printer with a sterilizable uh, epoxy resins, which looks like this. This is a laser. Um, uh, uh, STL printer, and after that, um, a sterilization um, and hardening of the implant is performed. And then um, I brought to you this video uh, to to show how the intraoperative fabrication of the implant works. Um, so we did this usually when the patient was still uh, being intubated and and brought into the RR. And um, as you might know, if you if you're into cake baking, you need to add some some oil or butter. We use neutral oil in this case, and then you can uh, nicely mold in the uh, PMMA dough, and uh, you can adapt uh, the amount of PMMA uh, to the to the uh, shape. Uh, you want to achieve. So if there's a lot of swelling, you would not take too much uh, PMMA. And if there's uh, a sunken flap, then you might take a little bit more to, to reduce the space um, with the, inside the implant. And so when the heating starts, you can take away the ring and after that remove uh, the plate quite easily if there's enough oil. And then the implant is ready for insertion uh, right um before actually the surgery uh, starts. And um, this is what it looks like. We usually put in uh, small holes and uh, for the for the tending sutures. And so intraoperative uh, pictures of this look like this. this. This is a patient with a bilateral craniectomy defect. This is an intraoperative uh, picture of uh, a cranioplastic implant we did with this spring form technique. And this is postoperative. Uh, skull shape, and these are CT seg segmentations of uh, uh, postoperative scans of the same patient. Uh, and on the bottom, you can see the pre-craniectomy, post-craniectomy, and post-cranioplasty uh, CTs, which show, uh, in my opinion, a very nice um, reconstruction of the pre-craniectomy skull shape. So um, this is a concept, not not in detail, but but in general, that has been uh, um, used worldwide actually in the in the last year. So it's it's quite common. 
I found I found um, literature from Brazil, from Mexico, Taiwan, uh, Korea, Lebanon, uh, Switzerland also, and of course uh, the Netherlands. And um, uh, we have used it for about three years now in Salzburg and um, have had more than 50 spring form implants. Uh, the outcome is usually really appealing. So, so, so patients were, were throughout the whole time very satisfied. Um, interesting is that even though this is a technically quite complex thing to do the whole 3D printing and design part, the total costs are, are striking um, compared to CAT CAM implants with uh, about 300 euros and the, all the buying the printer and stuff like this is included in this calculation. And the complication rates are uh, comparable to, to other alloplastic uh, materials. And what's really nice is that the planning and printing goes fairly uh, fast. So, so if we decided to, to do a cranioplastic surgery, now we could we could do it like three days later without having an implant at the time of decision. And um, we also use it for some uh, one stage craniotomy, cranioplastic surgeries, like in the in the picture on the right bottom, uh, where we uh, removed a, a large a large skull um, uh, meningioma and did the cranioplasty right away uh, with the spring form uh, technique. So um, uh, why why didn't we stay with this? Um, I I don't know. Uh, I was asked so many times why don't you print the just print the implant? And I I I would always say um, um I I'm not sure if it's possible, and if it's possible, it it's probably too complicated to to do it in a legal way. And um, then again the the guys from oral and maxillofacial surgery came up with the idea of buying a printer that can print a peak an effused filament fabrication technique. And apparently there was a printer um, at that time from Kumovis, now 3D Systems, uh, that can print under clean room conditions um, and is designed to print medical implants. There's a printing material um, from Ivanic Industries, um, also uh, um, designed for printing uh, human implants. And this is what the whole process looks like. And so we started a thorough uh, uh, a process uh, to develop this uh, kind of workflow at our institution. And the easy part is actually to, to design the implant. We, we do it usually right now. Uh, this way we, we merge the, again, the, the pre and post-operative or pre-post craniectomy CT scans via brain lab element software. Then uh, we have a, a, a model from the pre and uh, post craniectomy skull. And after that, we, we uh, send it to the Department for, of Medical Engineering in our hospital. And they will design with geometric freeform software um, an implant which looks like this, uh, resembling the pre craniectomy uh, skull shape. And, and this is the implant, and uh, support structures are added uh, just for printing. Okay, so this is the easy part. The hard part comes here. It's called the EU medical device regulation. And uh, it, usually it's really difficult and costly to, to get a, um, an implant onto the market within the EU. Um, even even in the, if, if, you, if you do this as a, as a company. Um, but there is a, a magic article. It's called Article 5.5. .5, and it's also called the Health Institution Exemption. And it, it uh, I have copied this part from the regulation. Um, and it says that if you, if you stay to the general safety and performance requirements, then the usual requirements of the regulation shall not apply to devices that are manufactured and used only within health institutions. institutions established established in the union so this this basically means if you if you have a concept uh, to to uh, design and 
a manufacturer and patient specific implant that you give to a patient within your institution, then different rules apply. <laughs> and those rules are, are laid out in the in the in this guidance article that I have put down. And it's all about validating a process of production. Um, um, and and that's actually what we did. And and because we could not do this on our own, we got a lot of help, um, as I, I show you here, from the 3D Systems Comovis uh, company, so from the printing uh, um, the company, uh, especially on technical aspects. Um, we had an external service provider called Pocket from Switzerland, who helped us to set uh, up the production process, the whole uh, quality management system, monitoring and uh, accordance to the EU regulation. And we had a lot of help, especially in the uh, technical part uh, from our uh, department of uh, medical engineering. So in, in the process that I will show you right now, uh, we, we define three main <laughs> acting characters, so to say. Um, uh, that is the treating neurosurgeon. That is um, um, one second. That is a three D printing expert from the um, a department of medical engineering and the case manager. And uh, so the whole process works like this: we do the data acquisition and segmentation, then we send it to the uh, uh, implant designer, so to to the three D printing expert. They design the implant and then they print template of the of the implant and the skull at the time post craniectomy, and then the implant shape and size and everything has to be cleared by the surgeon and the case manager, and then the implant is printing printed, uh, which looks like this. Um, the the peak filament is uh, uh, melted under very high temperatures. Uh, with this printing hat and then put layer by layer onto this onto this uh, plate um, and the whole process is is done under clean room conditions um so uh, uh, safety is is ensured by the printing process after the printing the implant looks like this then support structures have to be removed and um, holes are added in, in our process, and uh, then the implant can be sterilized with steam autoclave sterilization. Um, this is what it looks like intraoperatively. We, we also added the, the plates for fixation already. And before that, the implants, uh, implant has to be cleared again by the um, surgeon and by the case manager. So this is what it works like. And we did the first... Uh, uh, implantation of a 3D printed implant uh, this September. The patient was 63 years of age, had a traumatic brain injury with right-sided uh, subdural hematoma. She received um, uh, initial decompressive craniectomy and, and had a very good clinical recovery. And uh, this was the implant um, imp which fitted really well into the defect, was uh, fixed with for four whole titanium plates. And um, this is the, the post-operative, directly post-operative image. So we also use uh, a, a drain. And, and this is a segmentation of post-operative CT scan. And this is uh, the outcome um, about three weeks uh, post uh, cranioplasty. This is a CT scan of the head. As you can see, we uh, chose to uh, standardized the thickness of the implant to four millimeters, um, which eases um, uh, mechanical testing uh, of the implants in advance. Um, uh, we, we could have also chosen a thicker or thinner uh, variant, but this is very uh, stable. So um, uh, right now we have implemented this uh, process as a standard of care in our uh, institution. Um, we did uh, now 11 patients, actually th uh, 12, because today we did another one um, with a total of 13 implants. So two bilateral um, cranioplastic surgeries were performed and um, indications were mainly traumatic brain injury uh, Two patients with the malignant MCA strokes and one intracerebral hemorrhage. 
So in conclusion, I would say 3D printing aided molding of cranioplastic PMMA is, is very feasible, cost effective, and uh, quite uh, easy to implement. Um, at the same time, you could also uh, choose to um, establish a workflow to 3D print cranioplastic peak implants. Uh, at least in the EU, it can be performed the point of care um, in accordance with the EU MDR. And my 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 personal um, outlook is that uh, through this close interaction between the medical and the technical personnel uh, about 3D printing implants, um, uh, this can be used to drive more innovation in medical 3D printing um, of patient-specific implants, like also spinal implants or or more complex implants. That's what we are aiming to uh, to uh, 3D print also implants. Um, uh, for example, for orbital reconstruction and um, stuff like this. So uh, I, I want to end here and uh, want to give a very special thanks to the guys from uh, our medical engineering department, from the Department of uh, Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, and of course, to our uh, industrial uh, partners. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Johannes. Very, actually, very cool to see this, and um, um, very impressive that you that you manage and managed to to start this. I I'm not aware of any other center um, that is doing the same already. So um, now we have completed for our four talks, and um, we still have time. So uh, I think officially six minutes, but I hope we can take a bit of time to answer some questions. Some of you have already. Uh, commented on uh, open questions in the uh, FNA section. So um, one option would be um, for me to go through the questions just briefly, and then uh, we can discuss those together um, at the start. So uh, first question from Peter Werdemann is about closing uh, the skin. Uh, it's an well, interesting question. What would you guys advise, tapes or sutras? Um, and uh, he also says that he has published uh, a series. Okay, any comments? <coughs> we suture. Uh, maybe I, I can give a comment. I, I'm not sure if it makes a difference. I, I rely a lot on the on the quality of the skin, so to say. So if, if there's an easy skin closure, I usually... Uh, uh, use staples, but if there's uh, the skin is very um, uh, bad and and has bad edges, then I try to use um, um, uh, sutures uh, to get a better adaptation of the skin. I'm not aware of any uh, data on this. So this uh, this uh, series that has been pub published by uh, Peter Wellman might be interesting. Okay, next question. What's the peak implant cost? I think that basically has been answered by you, Johannes, in the talk, I guess. Oh, oh well, we we don't really have data what the what the the peak um implantation will cost in the in, in a real life scenario because now we have implemented it for the first time. So I, I cannot really tell. It's it's probably about half of the costs of an as CAT CAM implant. But but we we will have to wait for the real real world data, and um, because right now we we just started with the project and and uh, got some reductions and stuff like that. Yes, but yeah, but I think that you know this can be then also streamlined and costs can be reduced later on. And it's it's really hard to imagine how uh, actually three uh, D printing or whatever a uh, peak implant costs. I mean, in Germany, sometimes six thousand euros. So. Uh, I, I would hope that those costs would go down when you when you do this yourself. We 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 will be way below this price, <laughs> um, but it also depends on how much you use the printer. So so as as I said, this three uh, D printing uh, at the point of care can only happen for patients who who are treated in your institution. So 
Um, um, you can use it for for cranial maxillofacial surgery. You can use it for for orthopedic surgery, but it has to be all in one hospital uh, for one printer. Uh, Harry, can I ask you? Do, do you know the costs of a a peak implant in the UK? Because it would be interesting. Because we are from either Austria, Germany, or okay, uh, Rick, you can also maybe comment. But so Germany was, would be around six thousand euros for a larger defect. My my experience. Yeah, I, I don't know for a peak implant how much it would be a, a titanium implant. Uh, so we we have a service where we uh, we design them within our institute, but it was just too expensive and the regulations were too difficult to get uh, 3D printing on site. So we outsource the, 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 the printing of the of, of the file once we design it. And that process is a, a couple, probably a couple of thousand euros for a titanium implant uh, in, in total. But I don't know about the peak implant. No. Rick, do you, have any, do you have any knowledge on this? No, no, sorry. Okay. Not sure. what, what are you using? We're currently mostly using autologous bone. So the okay. peak is, is up and coming, but it's still mostly autologous. Right. Okay. okay, then another comment here uh, on uh, acrylic cranial implants, also 3D printed. Very interesting. Um, and then um, is a consensus on why holes are post drilled into the three D printed implants and then the number of size of the holes. I think okay, Rick uh, Johannes. Um, I mean, it's a question to you, but you 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 drill those. Otherwise, you you get companies drill those for you if you order an uh, allergenic. <coughs> I mean, there's no consensus in my in my knowledge, to my knowledge on on the you know number of holes etc. Um. Actually, actually, we 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 chose to to use a standardized uh, way of putting holes, um, um, because this was the standard of care before, also for autologous implants and also for um uh, the the PMMA implants we did before. Um, then then we did it by hand intraoperatively. Now now we do it in the in the in the lab when the when the implant is printed. So. Um, I I don't know if there's any evidence if if there should be should be holes or not. I think if you do not put holes, a drainage does not make much sense because then you cannot drain the 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 blood that can can uh, be under the implant. <laughs> so uh, I I think the the holes are main, mainly for drainage, maybe also for integration into the into the scar tissue. Yeah, so we had that discussion on this on uh, a meeting just recently, and it's really interesting that other that depending on the department and surgeon, um, people don't actually do those sutures, for example, those those holes for sutures as well. So, um, so there's obviously a huge variability and probably no consensus. We do the the holes for a lot of sutures and also to drain. We also put drains, so uh, that's um, non evidence based, but so that's our procedure. Um. Any other comments from you guys on, on, on holes in, in generally in, in the bone or in the implants? Okay. Adil, yep. Um, I have a question to Johannes. You have uh, shrinking problems with with the thermal process in the 3D printing. So so for me it's interesting with peak I, I i know sometimes there's a there's a problem of the accuracy or is it it doesn't happen it 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 would happen but uh there's i i did not show this there's a step included in the in the design process so um uh, the the implant is designed and then there there's um uh, an automatic um, uh, a mechanism that adds it's, it's actually a, a learning algorithm that adds some uh, size to the implant before printing to uh, to make it fit after printing because there is shrinking of peak after printing yes so 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 you have you have to adapt for it and 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 um, right now, right now we we do it um, uh, together with the uh, with the printer company, and and there there is a solution. And and right now we have we have excellent uh, fits of the of the implant, so so it's working well. But otherwise, they would be too a little bit too small, right? 
and this algorithm was developed mathematically based on KI or anything or experience or? <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure because I, I, I have not been into this, but as far as I know, it's it's a, a KI, a, AI development. So so the, the, the software is learning from the uh, uh from the with every implant uh, we make all right um another question here uh you, what is your protocol to preserve autologous uh bone flap so um maybe you can ask the panel in general so um rick you're still mainly using uh, autologous bone uh um, johannes so you not so much obviously uh and harry um Also, first the autologous bone. All right, so it's still a standard, okay. Yeah. And here for you, for you as well, right? Uh, in the UK. We we don't use it very much at all anymore. Ah, no. true. Yeah, remember now. Yeah, you have you had these you have no. these legal, uh, legal reasons, right? While back. Oh, true. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, it does still occasionally happen, but but almost it's by far and away uh, we synthetic materials does taken over. So we now do the same. We just recently, we had a uh, um, lawyers uh, coming to hospital, being at a, at a department and uh, giving us advice and uh, some regulatory people. And uh, it turns out that, I mean, at least in Germany, there are certain risks attached to biobanking those, uh, those bones. And we now also completely discarded the whole biobank and uh, uh, actually... <laughs> I sent letters out to all the patients that they can now go, come and pick up their bones, and uh, we switch to other to synthetic materials for mostly uh, legal reasons, but also for I mean, uh, growing evidence maybe that uh, there might be some benefits. Plus, uh, we did an analysis and we saw that we don't even implant we implant less than a third of uh, the bones that we take out because so many of those older pa patients um, uh, just. Uh, die or have a, a bad outcome and so we really biobank and uh, we throw away throw away but uh, it's a little inefficient so if it, it, before we preserved in a minus 80 degree freezer um, that's our was our standard normally this has to be controlled monitored etc which is difficult because you, you you otherwise have liability if you cannot prove that you had the biobanking conditions for this access has to be restricted and stuff like that but that's, that's still, I think, in Germany, the, the standard of uh, preserving those bones. Do you have any other techniques or? Uh, so, so we have completely abandoned it uh, for three years now. Um, also, also due to a new regulation, which forces us in Austria to take um, swaps um, uh, directly after explantation of the bone. Oh, really? Okay. Zero swaps. And it turns out that about 50% of them are positive with uh with uh, skin bacteria so with stuff epidermidis or or cutibacterium acnes and these have to be thrown away so so then you have only 50% left over and usually only implant about 50% of the explanted so so in the end you you have the whole biobank for about only 30% of of used implants and and the long range complications um so we, we abandoned it another question here about uh, how to fix uh, the bone so in our case we use microplates i think it depends on institutional um, practices in general uh, also it's a cost question probably i'm not aware that there's any uh, differences pediatric is obviously different but and then there's an interesting comment, uh, a 3D reconstructed patient-specific cranial implant for Mohammed Jihansip costs 150 US dollars. So there's uh, large differences to the prices we we just um, discussed. Okay, any cutoff edge uh, for pediatrics to put in the bone? So that's basically, that's, that's a topic where there's more evidence, obviously. A cutoff, do you guys work with cutoffs for kids? I mean, do you use age cutoffs? Now we are switched away completely, but for all pediatric and even young adults, we even before that we also did not uh, did not uh, re uh, re implant the autologous bone. So uh, without a fixed cutoff, but 
that those numbers are quite uh this is rare so the numbers are quite small in our center but um this definitely uh even below 30 of age uh, there was this discussion a lot of times okay another comment here yeah obviously saving the bone flap in the abdomen is is uh it's also a strategy, but um, I'm aware of, uh, of evidence that points to uh, increased rates of bone resorption for this uh, method. So I think it has been discarded um, uh, at least in a lot of centers in Germany for quite some time. Okay. And we have a lot of other questions um, in, the, in the chat. A lot of positive comments as well. Um, we'll skip those. <laughs> uh, optimal timing, I think we talked about this. Um, there's even so uh something I want to I mean maybe uh, put to discussion so yeah individualize yes and then if you have those um patient specific implants uh, you, you sometimes have very I mean if you three D printed you have no delivery time basically but even with some companies you have very um uh, short delivery times and you have implants that you can actually design so that they maybe can encompass a more swollen brain as well. So there is this tendency to, I mean, try to maybe in some individual cases, put the implant back in during the ICU stay at the end of it, and then discard, discharge the patient to the rehab. So, I mean, Rick, that's a little bit also, uh, I think what you uh, pointed out, I mean, this is a direction that things go. Yeah, so so w what we found was that mostly uh, patients were waiting on implants, especially on synthetic grafts. They were waiting on it. so they will be able to di get discharged through a rehabilitation home, for example, but they sure still were waiting on their implant. And certain rehabilitation physicians were sometimes hesitant to start intensive rehabilitation without a um, with a still evident cranial defect. So um, with our more recent experience, we it's, it's, we've looked into um, reemplacing the skull during the initial admission or... Um, uh, yeah, so so that might, we were also considering that it might be more cost efficient to reimburse the uh, reemplace the skull during the the initial admission, um, so it would prevent the secondary uh, admission um, and perhaps a longer length of stay. Yeah. Okay, then a comment on uh, lethal complication uh, ICH large ICH after craniopathy. So ICH is quite uncommon in our um, experience, epidural, uh, more likely. Uh, but this was, um, it was discussed by uh, the person who asked the question whether or not this is related to the drain, subgallial drain. So um, um, I think if, it's, I mean, if the door is, is closed and uh, you have the drain, I don't see necessarily where there is, you know, um, an effect on the ICP, a strong effect. So uh, I think it's a little bit debatable, but so we still use drains and I've seen a lot of patients. I mean, uh, the drains do not necessarily prevent epidural hematoma, but uh, I've seen a lot of patients having very swollen defects, um, skin and muscle. And um, I think the drain still, I mean, there's no evidence, right? But uh, still the, the drains actually too mostly in our case uh, Still prevent this. Also, um, the wound healing is improved, etc. But I mean, do you, what what is your experience? I think we talked about drains before, but just briefly, do you have this kind of compli complication where you have an ICH um, after craniopathy? Uh, I'm. I mean, with the drain, uh, as I talked, it is important to use the, the the active drain if you train. I think, but there are different uh, techniques, and 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 uh, I know there are some drains with a fixed pressure. So you can only open or close. And this is maybe more problematic than the types with with, with different um, uh, steps or levels of pressure because the highest pressure is really, really strong. And so there is a me mechanism in different patients that the dura changed or moved out and you so so you can have this 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 icp changes that's that's not i have never seen it in in more than one or 
too patient, but there, there's a problem. So I, I would, um, the, the solution is active train, but with different level, with the person, so, so not to use the, 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 the trains with, with only pressure or no pressure. So this is maybe a solution for this problem. <laughs> There are, I think it's it's important to avoid um, hematoma epidural for or subgaleal with this technique. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then some good points. What's the difference in outcome complications depending on what kind of dual replacement R was used in the first surgery? So I think uh, we all agree that uh, doing cranioplasty is, I mean, you, you guys have pointed this out, it's not that easy as a procedure. It might, can be difficult sometimes and also depends on the previous surgery, definitely. Uh, those registries, maybe, I don't know if you look at this, I looked at this uh, in detail, what the uh, previous durable construction was. Are you aware of, of any real evidence that certain material or um, certain technique uh, might be beneficial or might be. I mean, we all know that there are different cases where uh, the surgery is more complicated and there's uh, cases where it's very clean, um, the intersection plane. So do you have any uh, uh, suggestions for this? So we haven't looked uh, directly at outcomes relating to uh, specifics around uh, the Jura, uh, certainly, but uh, we are increasingly aware that uh, the impact that the craniectomy has on cranioplasty outcomes. And so we're trying to uh, increase our data collection around the craniectomy procedure rather than just the, the very basic information around the uh, uh, around craniectomy. So I think that's an area where we're, we're expanding the registry. Uh, but but it's, yeah, it would be interesting to look at uh, look at Jura uh, and outcomes. I, we haven't done that specifically from our, from our side. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so, so from my my point of view, uh, we are about together with another hospital in Austria to to collect data on this topic because they do it different from our standard of care. I believe that if if you do a late cranioplasty, it does not matter that much because then you have a you have a stable dural scar. But if you do a really early, then then just just putting something underneath the dural opening and and leave it there without without suturing a, a dura dura plastic inside uh, makes a lot of work doing cranioplasty at least to 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 close the dura again so i think the the uh, uh, the time of cranioplasty matters on on the on the effect of of dura closure in the in the cranio craniectomy yeah i would agree Okay, uh, the last questions here. Um, is there a recommendation titanium versus acrylic materials? Um, I, I'm i aware of one uh, actually prospective, I think, uh, I don't know how it was controlled and randomized, but there is a, a titanium study out there um, published uh, some time ago uh, where titanium was compared to other logos bone and uh, not to acrylic materials, unfortunately, but this is one of the only, I think, um, basically RCTs. And um, uh, they just showed that uh, while it's expensive, there's no bone disruption, which makes sense. But um, I'm not aware of any direct comparison, but this is obviously the, a topic where a lot of research is now uh, going into and people try to uh, to put out, to, to start those prospective trials, comparing materials. Are you, do you have any recommendation, Harry? Not specific recommendation. It's very uh, uh, institute dependent uh, and, and neuroscience dependent. Uh, we're heavily biased in our UK data on titanium, uh, but that's because that's the what's gained traction and is used commonly. I think it's a really good opportunity to try and develop maybe a European wide registry. We are looking at that and uh, trying to uh, answer some of the certainly the material question. We need to link up data. From different centres and look at long, uh, long term, uh, long achievable data around this. So no, I don't. There aren't. I don't have any specific recommendations on what on one or the other. Uh, but but it's but it's needed as as you've alluded to. I have no experience with titanium, to be honest. So, um, no recommendation that. 
Okay, and um, uh, one comment, very interesting. Um, in the Punjab Institute of Neuroscience in Pakistan, patients get um, three 3D reconstructed acrylic cranial implants for free. So that's obviously very impressive. Congratulations. Uh, what is your post-operative antibiotic protocol uh, with the synthetic versus autologous bone? We have no antibiotic. We do no antibiotics after those acrylic procedures, as a standard at least. What about you? I I think there's no no evidence that um, prophylactic antibiotic therapy is in, indicated in any in any surgical intervention intervention, only if it's septic. So so no, we we just do intraoperative single shot. Let's uh, have folks see. Yeah, we do the same. So uh, perioperative and then no further antibiotic regimen. Okay, so we have completed all the questions. If there's no more and uh, the people have already uh, quit, <laughs> but thank you, the 74 people still in uh, in uh, the Zoom for staying and thank you to the um, the panel, each of uh, you guys for uh, doing this and giving those talks. Thank you very much. It was really excellent. And thank you everybody for participating and discussing. Looking forward to uh, seeing and meeting you all uh, next time. One last thing we uh, from the ENS, there will be a survey uh, on cranioplasty. Uh, it's going to be sent out soon. So every small one, three to five minutes. And I think uh, you can even get an uh, authorship if you uh, if you participate. So um, feel free to maybe uh, answer those questions. It's on ma mostly materials. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, Alex. Bye-bye. Thank bye you, guys. Alex. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Alex.